your seats now and we'll get started with the keynote in just a minute. Okay, well, welcome to the second full day of the <coughs> Second International Sustainable Consumption Research and Action Initiative. I'm Cindy Eisenhower with the University of Maine, and I'm going to yield the podium for a minute to Maury Cohen, um, one of the co-founders of SCORE, for a quick announcement. Okay, thanks, Cindy. Just very quickly, um, yesterday morning, um, we had a pre-conference uh, session on decadent consumption. Um, Anybody who attended that session but didn't get a chance to sign the or put their name and contact details on the follow-up sheet, um, please see me. Um, and even if you weren't at that session but you think you have an interest in decadent households and decadent consumption, um, um, feel free to chase me down and I'd be glad to add you to a list of uh, uh, we've been accumulating of, uh, of individual details just to stay in touch over the next uh, couple of weeks and months. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, I'd like to welcome you all back, and I'd also especially like to welcome members of the local and campus community who have come today to join us at the conference. Um, as you all know, this uh, our keynote speakers have been sponsored by different units across campus, their travel expenses, and so we're very grateful for that, um, and indeed for all of our sponsors. Um, today's keynote is being sponsored by the college, oh, uh, I'm going to skip that for now by the College of um, Liberal Arts and Sciences, and I'm very happy to have with us today um, the Dean of the Liberal the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Emily Haddad. Um, Emily is an accomplished academic, in addition to being a, a great leader, with a degree in comparative literature from Harvard University. She specializes in English literature with a focus on intercultural contract, as portrayed in 19th century British lit. Emily is also a strong supporter of thoughtful and engaged curriculum development and has previously worked to establish new academic programs centered on sustainability studies. So she has some interests similar to ours. Dean Haddad, welcome, and thank you so much for your support of the keynote. Thank you, Cindy. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, the interest in sustainability is truly near and dear to my heart. Um, the issues that this conference is exploring are really of central importance to the future that we all anticipate. It's very easy, um, and I do it nightly, uh, to look at climate change headlines and despair. Uh, meetings like this give one some prospect for uh, truly effective alternatives to the unsustainable systems that have gotten us where we are. So I thank all of you for being willing to make this part of your life's work. The effort to develop and implement alternatives such as these will be at the heart of the liberal arts and sciences in decades to come. Traditional liberal arts values can help us foster the cross-disciplinary dialogues that are necessary to rethink, re-examine, and ultimately to replace unsustainable systems. And researchers from across the liberal arts and sciences will be needed to make this effort come to fruition. This morning's keynote speaker exemplifies the kind of interdisciplinary integration that will be needed uh, from all of us in the future. Dr. Georgios Kallis is an exceptionally capable scholar in the field of environmental policy and planning, among other things. He's a professor at the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology in Barcelona, Spain, and uh, now is just finishing an appointment as the Leverholm Visiting Professor at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He earned his doctorate at the University of the Aegean. Dr. Callis is currently the principal investigator on a project exploring social innovation for alternative ecological economies that's funded by the Spanish Ministry of Economy and Competition and it's the latest in a long string of grants that he's received over the past decade. He publishes prolifically. His most recent articles have appeared in Ecological Economies and also the Association of the American Geographers, Global Environmental Change, and Environment and Planning, among other journals. He's co-editor of a 2014 book entitled Degrowth, a Vocabulary for a New Paradigm, and that's published by Rutledge Earthscan. This past year at the University of Athens, he organized a conference on the topic Prosperity Without Growth. 
his lecture today entitled Political Ecological Con Economics will address related issues. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Georgios Kallas. happy to be here and get to know the SCORI community. I've heard a lot about it through Philip and Kalina, but now I have the opportunity also to meet you and see the exciting research uh, that you do. Uh, today, I mean, my starting point is the starting point, I think, also this conference from all the presentations I've heard uh, for the first day. So two looming challenges in our times. I don't think I have to say much about them, but on the one hand, we have uh, climate change and the ever-increasing uh, carbon emissions, hand-in-hand hand with the scale of the economy. On the other hand, we have a, a, a growing inequalities, especially in our part of the world, in the global north, and the return to a condition that Thomas Piketty, in his recent book, called the neo a patrimonial society, a neo-patrimonial society, or we might call it a neo-feudal society, where a few people, very few people, hold the majority of the wealth, while all the rest uh, live in uh, conditions that they are not, uh, uh, they cannot sustain their livelihoods. Uh, these two dual challenges uh, in the mainstream discourse can be killed, uh, as you say, one bird, uh, sorry, uh, with uh, two birds with one stone, you know? Uh, and the one stone is what? Economic growth, as always. So the idea is that by growing more the economy and modernizing the economy, we can reduce carbon emissions, we can have a transition to renewable energies that they will, not emit, uh, will not emit carbon. And on the other hand, that by growing the pie, we will be able to distribute some more of the crowns to those who don't have access to the, to the, to the important part, part of the pie. And in this way, uh, reduce also inequalities. That's the business as usual, as usual uh, thinking, and I would call it is a wishful thinking. It's a wishful thinking, first of all, if you're a scientist or if you're an economist. Economists like a lot uh, to do econometrics and find correlations. And if there is one correlation that I think uh, it's one-to-one -one, doesn't stand any, any more scrutiny about it, is the relationship between GDP and carbon emissions. So GDP and any other environmental damage that you might want to glow together. So the wishful thinking here is that somehow by a moment of a miracle, somehow these two lines are going to completely decoupled, and while the red one will keep going to infinity, the blue one will sink to zero. I call this wishful thinking because we don't have any evidence to know that this can happen. And the evidence that we have is that carbon emissions are directly related uh, to economic activity and to the scale of the economy. This doesn't mean, of course, that the blue and the red lines have to go together to zero, but my basic hypothesis here is that some type of contraction of the economy, of economic activity, of the scale of economic activity, is necessary if we are seriously talking about reducing carbon emissions. Then, of course, the challenge becomes how do we do that while reducing inequalities? What we know from history is that the only time that inequalities were reduced in capitalist economies were after a huge catastrophe, which was the Second World War, that wiped out wealth uh, all around. And then, through a period of very fast growth, this type of more equal condition that was created by the destruction of the world was maintained for a few years until the 1980s. Then again, this, uh, this changed. We need to think differently, and Tim Jackson was one of the first people in 2008 that put down the hypothesis of prosperity without growth. That we need to think outside of the box and think if we were to contract the economy, or at least not have growth, how could we prosper, or how could we have equality, how could we reduce inequalities, but without economic growth? I would say that mainstream economics uh, is not up for the task of answering this question of prosperity without growth. Uh, I could go, I could go for, for hours talking about why it's not up about it. But I mean, the basic premise of uh, uh, mainstream economics ever since Adam Smith is how to increase the wealth of nations. So it's a whole model that it's built around the question of how to increase wealth, how do you keep growing. 
uh, to take this model and simply invert it and say that the factors that lead to economic growth, if we were just to reduce them, would lead to a contraction of the economy, I think would be stupid. So, I mean, the argument would never be that we have to destroy capital, uh, destroy education systems, destroy institutions that we know that they are causing the economic growth in order to have the growth. We need to step out of this framework and start thinking differently about the economic and whatever this economic might be. And we need, I think, a different language. We need to escape from the language of mainstream economics. So I'm not the only one to say that, of course. There is a, after the financial crisis, there is a wealth of new alternatives and new projects that people are trying to do to redefine the language of economics. Uh, I want to talk with one particular project, which is the project of the growth, the intellectual project of the growth, that I'm part of. And just to say that a lot of these initiatives are very interesting. They attack the, and they criticize and they try to provide new alternatives to the mainstream economics uh, narrative of Homo economicus that we heard yesterday now, optimizing agents, equilibrium, etc. But a lot of the critique and the heterodox economics is also stuck in a productivist, growthist uh, imaginary. So the Keynesian model, which is the alternative that we hear both in policy and in academic discourses, it's still stuck in the idea of perpetual growth. Perpetual growth that would be distributed better, but still it's perpetual growth. And I think it also has problems of dealing with the possibility that we might need to contract the economy if we were to become sustainable. So it's still based on the idea that we can green the economy and keep growing by greening the economy. Which I will argue it's, a, it's a probably a wrong uh, hypothesis. Of course, I cannot prove it wrong, but I will give some arguments. <coughs> so our book that you can uh, also consult it up there in the in the Rutledge's uh, in the Rutledge's table and uh, and you might want to see the contents and see what it looks like. But it's an edited volume where what we thought about doing was uh, there are many people who are writing about the growth. So the first first kind of uh, idea we have about what this word growth might mean would be a contraction of the economy, a long contraction of the economy that would be ecologically sustainable. And more than that, it's a ruthless critique, I would call it, of the idea or ideology of economic growth. So if we are trying to garner all the different uh, arguments why this idea of economic growth is fundamentally absurd. <laughs> And to give you the more stronger reason, which is not ecological, it's not social, it's not political, why this idea is absurd is that any number that tends to increase at the constant rate of growth every year, 3% per year, which means it doubles every 22 years or so, or 23 years, at some point tends to infinity. And we know that no number that has to do with some kind of production can turn to infinity. This is an absurd idea that something the economy or whatever else is going to is gonna go to infinity. At some point, we know that it has to come to an end. Uh, but uh, the growth is not an economistic discourse. So it's not a discourse that is being created by economists. The, the most well-known advocate of the growth is Serge Latouche, who is an anthropologist from France. Uh, it brings sociologists in it. It brings environmental scientists like myself, interdisciplinary scientists. So it's not a, dis a discourse of economics. I would call it, and I think we capture it a little bit without being uh, conscious about it in the cover of the book, it's a potluck of ideas. Uh, not a soup, I, I hope it's not a soup of ideas, but it's a potluck. So it's different people bringing different ideas and different concepts to the table. And this is how we structure the book. So it's a set of keywords, keywords that they are important for articulating this new language that we need to think about uh, this challenge. And we welcome the reader to read the book not in a linear way, starting from the first chapter and going to the last, but entering one keyword and then seeing how different keywords link with others and try to make that their sense of what this new language can offer. But what I want to do today is to go a little bit ex post and try to give my own sense to the economic, uh, of the understanding of the economy that comes out of this uh, big growth uh, debate. So it's not that the growth is explicitly building on a particular economic theory. What I'm doing is going ex post on this whole lots of ideas and trying to say what understanding of the economy underlies it. Okay. I'm going to do this through my own lens. So my own lens is I'm a trained, or I consider myself first and foremost an ecological economist, which means I'm not so much an economist, I'm more of an interdisciplinary scientist combining ecological ecology and uh, economics. But I'm also a political ecologist, so let me give you a brief, uh, brief definitions of what these terms and what these schools of thought are doing. Ecological economics is an economics where matter matters, or if you want to say differently, nature matters. 
So unlike mainstream economics, uh, uh, in ecological economics, we take energy and the materiality of nature very seriously. We believe that it's fundamental for the economic process, fundamental for growth, was the capturing of fossil fuels and uh, high net energy resources. It was with this that the capitalism and industrialization took uh, off. But we also take very seriously the limitations that nature, ecosystem services, fossil fuels are putting on the economy, but they constrain it in fundamental ways. Political ecology is slightly different. So it comes from a combination of political economy, or if you want to call it Marxist political economy, and ecology. Political economy plus ecology equals political ecology. Then political ecology plus ecological economics <laughs> equals what I want to talk about. That's, that's as mathematical as this. Uh, <laughs> so political uh, ecology focuses, given its Marxist legacy, on power relations and on the fundamental conflict always involved when we transform nature, both economic and ecological distribution conflict. So the distribution of environmental goods and bads and the power relations that they are implied in this distribution, and of course within an understanding of capitalist uh, dynamics. But it does something else which is fundamentally different. Political ecology is also questioning the construction of our ideas and the construction of concepts, the social construction of concepts, and the social construction also of science and scientific activity. The figure of Michel Foucault looms large in this line of thinking of political ecology. Just to put it very simply, Foucault was, uh, maybe I'm saying something that's very well known for many of you here, but for those that it's not known, Foucault, for example, wrote a book on madness, no? uh, the history of madness. And his basic idea was like that this concept that we take as granted as a scientific concept, madness, no, that doctors evaluate and uh, say who is mad and who is not mad. <coughs> he unearthed the historical construction of this concept. I mean, he found that there was uh, uh, empty prisons after the French Revolution. Who would you put there? Who would you put deviant people? Who were the deviant people? They were defined as those that they had different behaviors from the rest. There was a whole construction of what madness means that was institutionalized through a carceral system, and it became true in a way. It became true by being enacted. And today we take madness as a granted concept. Political ecologists have done very similar work to question the concept of nature and the concept of conservation, and to deconstruct its colonial origins and how it was part and parcel of a colonial power dynamics, and particular ideas of what we consider, we in the West considered as natural, which was very different from what was considered as what were the interactions with a non-human world in the rest uh, of the world. So with these two, these two uh, lines of thought, I want to combine them and say something about the economy, which I think is, is capturing what the growth, what's the theory behind the, the growth. Let me say that I'm not trying to, to launch a new term here or become the father of political and ecological economics. I don't think we need the new terms. It's just that the term that captures what I'm talking about today, but if you want, never reproduce this term. I think we can do political ecology and ecological economics, and it's uh, fine enough. And let me say that what I'm going to say, if you are an economist, it's going it's to sound a little bit strange because it's very disciplinary. <coughs> it's not grounded in standard economic supply, demand, etc. It has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about here. I was happy to read yesterday an uh, excerpt from an interview from Anwar Saik, who is a heterodox economist in the New School. And he said that we don't need to criticize any more than classical economics. What we need to do is behave as if we are extraterrestrials that we just arrived on Earth, and we want to describe we see the economy, or whatever might be called the economy, and we try to, to analyze it. And I think that's a little bit what's happening here. Although I'm not extraterrestrial, I have very specific stakes and experiences. <laughs> So, first of all, four, four arguments I'm going to make, sorry, five arguments about what, what the economy is from this understanding, and then I'm going to apply it a little bit and relate it to the degrowth proposal. So, the first one is that the economy is an invention, and this might sound strange now. Uh, Timothy Mitchell, an anthropologist, a well known anthropologist from Columbia University, makes this argument explicitly in his work, and especially in his latest book, Carbon Democracy. <coughs> it's important to start with the point that what we understand today as the economy, which is a system, and it's a national system bounded, the US economy, the Greek economy, etc., that it's a very recent invention. So this term and this understanding of the economy as a system that is exogenous it's autonomous and exogenous from the rest of society is an invention that appears, believe it or not, in around the 1930s, 1940s, 
with the invention of the national accounts, GDP accounting, growth of the economy, planning for war, and later planning for the welfare state, Keynesianism, as we might call it. Even in the work of Keynes himself, economy has a very different understanding, which is the economy that, it is the understanding that passed through the ancient Greeks up until around that time, the 1930s. And economy, it's a verb, it's an action. It's economizing, it's saving, it's doing things with as little effort or as little resources as possible. Importantly, from the ancient Greeks or Aristotle, for example, this was not a matter he distinguished it from grammatistics, which was the science of money, because Greeks had also money. Economy was the management of the household. And the classical economists had still this notion of the management, the governing of the common household, which is our affairs. You might argue, of course, that production, consumption, distribution, exchange have always been in all societies now. So even if we gave a new word for them, the economy has always been there now. But I think it would be wrong to say that, because it's a very important step that we are making when activities that other societies, before capitalist societies, did not see them as a unified whole, as part of the same experience as the economic system, we start seeing them as an independent system. Now that it has to grow, it has its own laws of supply and demand, etc. For example, we know from the work of anthropologists that the hunter-gatherer societies did not treat these uh, features, production, distribution, exchange, as separate from the rest of their social obligations, social bonds, etc. They were part of the social whole. They were not an isolated, different part that it's the economy and it's out there, it's different from society or politics. So this shift, this invention, has fundamental implications. And like madness, uh, I wasn't ready for this, uh, for this metaphor, but I think like madness, it works well. It was also institutionalized and instituted with ministers of national economy appearing first in the 1940s, 1930s, and also with the GDP accounts, the way we see things, the way we measure things, the way we devise uh, policies. This doesn't mean that it's not real now. Institutionalized, it becomes real. So if you're mad and you're put in a mad asylum, this is very real for you. In the same way, if you have, if you have policies that they are geared on pursuing an increase of GDP, this is as real as it gets for us. We experience that. But it is also a construction at the same time. In relation, it is important to recognize that this construction has a political dimension. So very often we hear in the mainstream discourse about the free market, the invisible hand, the natural state of the economy. Now, if we didn't meddle with it, there would be a natural condition, or it would be the natural economy where buyers and sellers just meet the exchange and then there is an equilibrium of their supply and their demand now. And that this is a natural thing of how things work. Carl Polanyi, an economic anthropologist, in many books, most notably in The Great Transformation, made the important argument that far from being the natural state of things, that's the exception. So the norm, the historical norm, has been for societies to regulate and protect <coughs> themselves from the dynamic of this unlimited and uh, unhindered exchange and uh, so-called free market uh, dynamic. And uh, Polanyi made the very important argument that far from being the free market, the natural uh, outcome and the natural state of things, the construction of what we conceive as the market, as the free market, was a very political process that used huge force, huge state force, in order to create the conditions and the institutions that made such transactions possible. Political ecologists have done fantastic work to show this in today's context. Like, for example, think of ecosystem services. It's far from natural to start trading these things called ecosystem services or cannibal credits or trade water. This has never happened and it takes huge resources, financial resources, intellectual resources and huge state and police power in order to implement these things. So the market is not just out there, it's constantly created and constructed politically, which means that we can construct also different economies if we want to keep the word economy. Again, it's going to be a political process that it's going to have to use a type of uh, state force, a force of creating these different and alternative economies. But of course the economy is material, because if I stayed here I would have been a cultural anthropologist. <laughs> Probably I wouldn't be invited here just for the plenary, but maybe I would. But the economy is also material, and this is my ecological economics and environmental scientist, uh, environmental scientist hat. 
And you might say that it's contradictory with a, with a anthropological and constructive stuff. No, if it's an invention, how come it is material? Yes, it's an invention how we delineate the system. But production and consumption activities, they take fundamentally matter uh, from uh, non-human nature and transform it into something different. I don't think we have to, to question much of that. If we were to question it, probably we would die of, uh, without eating in a few days. No? So that's, that's a very biophysical reality. In ecological economics, we talk about the me metabolism of societies, social metabolism. It is like think of the metabolism of your body, aggregated at the level of the society, both endosomatic within your body, but also exosomatic, like the energy that goes to fuel the airplanes that move us around, bring our food, uh, cultivate our food, etc. That's the metabolism of a society. Nicolas georgescu Rogan, uh, one of the prominent figures of uh, ecological economics, argued that this process of metabolism is fundamentally entropic. What does it mean entropic? It means that we take high-order uh, energy and matter from nature, we process it, we use it, to produce useful things for us, we produce order, but this creates also disorder. So at the end, we end up with energy that's no longer useful. Think of carbon emissions, you cannot recycle them back and turn them into energy again. This is a unidirectional process. It's a directional process for more to less order. It's also a process where by creating order here, we create disorder somewhere else. So we take energy to, to fuel the lamps here and have light, but this energy comes from somewhere. There are impacts and disorder where this energy is taken from. No? This is fundamental ecological understanding of the economic process. I think uh, Georgescu Rogan's argument was stuck in a little bit in an unproductive debate, whether this signals that there are ultimate limits to growth and at some point energy is going to end up and we, we won't be able to live in the planet anymore, etc. And of course, in a, very, in, a very, in a very easy way, you can understand that the planet Earth is not a closed system, it's an open system and receives energy from the sun. No? And this energy can last for billions of years. So yes, at the end, when the sun will stop shining, we won't have any more energy. Up till then, we can live with the energy of the sun, and this is something George Rogan recognized. What he said, though, and I think that's the important contribution of, of his work also, is that there is a fundamental difference between resources like fossil fuels, that they are tapped and concentrated, and uh, resources uh, uh, where the energy is uh, very, very concentrated, and solar flow where it's diffused. Think of the difference of a water reservoir, a lake, and rain. No? To capture rain, you need to put a lot of resources to concentrate it somewhere. You need land, and you need to put a lot of, a lot of more effort to concentrate it somewhere. So fossil fuels were a quite unique source of energy on the backs of which this modern industrial civilization built up. Renewable energies can fuel a level of economic activity, but you're just going to argue, or hypothesize if you want, that this is going to be a much smaller level of economic activity. Why is it going to be smaller? Because the net energy, the energy that we're going to take out of renewable uh, sources, taking out the energy that we have to spend in order to produce this energy, the energy we're going to spend to produce solar panels, for example, or windmills, at the end we are left <coughs> with a much smaller level of net energy than we were left with fossil fuels. With fossil fuels, you know, you just at the beginning, you just dig a hole and then the oil flew out. This was a huge energy return on energy investment, which is much lower for solar for solar energy. Also, solar energy has all the other impacts: land, uh, land, uh, land uses, uh, materials used for it, etc. So it's only at the lower level of economic activity that we can live by solar energy. This is not bad. I think. This is a very fundamental idea on which the big growth uh, paradigm builds on, this fundamental insight of uh, the school of music. But I think it's very different from what you hear in the green growth discourses, the Keynesian discourse too, which is the idea that, you know, we need to make a transition to renewable energies. If the state spends a lot of money, you know, we're going to have both growth and make the transition, which sounds like a very nice story. But if this story of the school is correct, this other story is not correct. There can't be both right. Because, of course, you can spend money, but this doesn't mean that you will maintain the same possibilities for accumulation in the future if you have less and less net energy in the future from solar, from solar panels. Uh, 
you know, in Keynesianism, there is this thought that, you know, you can pay people when you're in a crisis, you can pay them to dig holes, and then you can pay them also to cover the holes. And this <laughs> creates some liquidity, and then the economy takes over. But of course, you cannot just move the economy by making people dig holes and cover holes, no? At some point, you need some other source of primary accumulation to come from. And if this source is not fossil fuels, I think it's very difficult that it's going to be renewables. Let me go make a caveat here. I don't like to think, and this is common in ecological economics, to think of uh, the economy of the society as something that is constrained by absolute ecological limits within which, you know, we are constrained to do certain things. Well, what I want to say about that, I want to be careful with that, and of course I'm going to discuss it uh, after, if you're interested in that. I think it's important, and a lot of the discourse around peak oil, for example, we are running out of oil, or even uh, treating climate change as a sink, which I find a very strange metaphor, no? We are running out of sink capacity. I mean, imagine what sort of imaginary it has to take to think of the atmosphere as a sink, no? And then say that it's running out, we are running out of this capacity, no? It's, it's because it's a very mentality of economics, which treats nature as a reservoir, you know, a reservoir that we need, like a, a gasoline reservoir for our car, that is running out. I think we are stuck in the mindset of economics if we see nature in this very limited way of things running out uh, for us. I prefer the metaphor also from ecological economics and from my mentor in Berkeley with whom I worked on developing this concept of coevolution. That humans and nature are in a mutually transformative uh, relationship. We always transform and we have always transformed a uh, non-human nature. Think of us as beavers. No, beavers also construct dams. Ants also construct colonies. We construct also our colonies, our, our dams, with fundamentally much higher uh, throughput of energy and materials. But we do transform and are being transformed by our transformations. Does this mean that anything can happen? No, it doesn't mean that anything can happen. It means that if we keep transforming and create colonies the way we create by emitting uh, carbon dioxide, we're going to create very undesirable outcomes in the future. These are going to be coevolutionary outcomes. It's not that with climate change one day we're all going to be dead and that was it, the end of the story, no? There will be new forms of social formations, new type of relations with nature, and probably even our state of the knowledge, very undesirable, very much worse than the ones we currently have. But I think it's important to maintain this understanding, this imaginary for relationship with non-human nature as one of a mutual and constant transformation, where knowing that we don't want to produce certain outcomes, we don't want to produce an outcome of unlivable environments by climate change, we want to limit ourselves, we want to limit our carbon emissions, we want to leave oil in the soil. I'm going to come back to that in my last point. I'm running a little bit slower than I liked. Uh, the economy is diverse, so that's that's the fourth point of understanding the economy in a different way. And this comes from feminist economists, Catherine Gibson and Julie Graham. Gibson Graham was the pen name they were writing uh, together. And this is the idea, which we heard from John yesterday also, of the fundamental importance of care for the economy, of the fundamental impo importance of the non-economic or the non-monetary economic for the sustenance of the economy. Gibson Graham, make this very visible and nice to understand the iceberg uh, model, no? On the top is the economy that we understand as the economy, capitalist markets and wage labor, no money exchanges. But behind that, to sustain that top of the iceberg there, behind it you have all the work that goes into the household, for example, care work that it's gender. But you have also all the other top sort of economies, production, consumption, that it's taking place without being monetized, from cooperatives, from voluntary work to gift exchanges, all sorts of other activities that they are taking place and sustaining, without which this monetary economy on the top wouldn't be sustainable, would not be sustained. Gibson Graham argued that it's important to understand that this is the iceberg, because if we only focus, and a lot of critical or heterodox economists just focus on the top of the iceberg, then we reify the system that we are about to criticize. We think that's just the only reality. But there are alternatives, and they are already here, and they have always been here. They have always been here, but in the last years, these and these alternatives are increasingly incorporated, commodified, if you want to call it, in the upper part of the, of the iceberg. So household labor is commodified when you start paying for someone to take care of your elder parents or to clean your house. Tourism, hospitality, which was a gift, 
exchange typically in other times, it's commodified through the tourism industry. So more and more of alternative economies are becoming part of the mainstream capitalist economy. This, I would hypothesize, has repercussions because when you have a crisis like the one we have now, you have much, you have much less resilience to, uh, to survive without support from the crematistic money economy. You don't have any more of these networks of support than in previous times would provide support to households to continue their provisioning without necessarily income through the, through the mainstream market system. Okay? So, I said that we have to understand that the economy is first and foremost an invention. Second, that this invention is politically constructed. Third, that it has a material throughput. And fourth, that if we talk about the economy, we don't talk just about the, the market economy. We talk about a broader system of provision. So my last point. So I would argue that the key question of econo economics should not be, or is not scarcity, <laughs> but it should be abundance, or surplus, if you want to say, the excess that we have. <coughs> What do I mean by that? Economics, uh, Robbins wrote the famous book in the 1940s defining the science of economics, and he says, is the science of the allocation of uh, scarce resources or scarce means to unlimited ends. Okay, so we have a few things we want to produce. We have unlimited desires as humans, but we have only a few things that we can do, no? So economics help us decide how to allocate. Should I go to the conference or should I stay at home? <laughs> Should I become a professor or should I become a football player? Unfortunately, I couldn't. That was an easy, <laughs> easy solution. But uh, we always have this type of choices. And economists say these are economic choices because we can't do everything. We can't have everything. But look that from the very fundamental definition of scarcity, scarcity is something that is perpetual and we can never overcome from an economist's perspective. Because if our desires are unlimited, no matter how many resources we're going to have, they will never be now. No? They are always unlimited. So we are always stuck in this economic world of scarcity. And this, I think, was a very fundamental invention of economists to justify the capitalist system that was emerging in, in their time. It's interesting, for example, that the Robbins, in his book, as the example, he gives whom of scarcity? Robinson Crusoe. He was, a, he was a popular example among economists at the time, but they hadn't invented mathematical models so well. So they had Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> and they say he arrived in the island, no, he has everything, he could live and just take it easy, but instead he still has uh, scarcity. You know, why? Because he might go and fetch water, he might go and kill a bird, he might go and uh, build clothes for him. So they say even in this situation of apparent abundance, there is always scarcity because there are so many things that you might want to do. Of course, it's only people like Robinson Crusoe or Robbins that have this idea that they have to do thousands of different things when they are in a very beautiful island. <laughs> but I think, I think it's, precisely, it's precisely the imaginary of economics that we have to criticize and question with a new, with a new economics. This is not my own idea. I mean, I'm trying to develop it, but Nicholas Xenos, who I haven't had the, the chance to meet yet, uh, has written a fantastic, fantastic book. He's a professor of politics, I think, in uh, Michigan. Uh, scarcity and modernity. So Xenos has a history of the idea of scarcity, and he says that the, fun the fundamental paradox, which can easily be explained in, structure, in, his, uh, in the cover of his book, is that the idea of scarcity appears for the first time in precisely the time that the uh, capitalist system starts producing unique abundance of material goods. So previous societies did not have this idea of scarcity. No? And then when we first start producing an am amazing amount of goods, then this idea of scarcity appears. Uh, what does Xenos argue, or what I, I argue reading Xenos is happening there? First of all, with capitalism, we know that what we're having is a process of enclosures, no? What were the commons are being enclosed, the pastures, but many other things, and they are brought into capital circulation. So on the one hand, there is a real experience by people who before had access to the basic means of their subsistence, of a basic uh, sense of material scarcity, no? But at the same time, we have something that's quite unique of the time, and it's what you're very familiar with here. And it's the emergence of an unlimited, an unbridled, unconstrained uh, pursuit of conspicuous consumption, <coughs> positional consumption. So capitalism does away with hierarchical ordering of the feudal society. Everyone can become rich, at least in theory now. 
And this fluidity creates a very important of positional consumption. I have more than you. I would like to have as much as my neighbor. This creates also a fundamental dynamic of perpetual scarcity. You can never have enough because there is someone else who has more than you. And this keeps growing to the norm higher and higher up. And growth can never satisfy that. It just moves, just moves the bar higher and higher. You know, we have much more today than someone would have in the 19th century. In one sense, we should have resolved scarcity even if it existed at some point. We haven't. Because the norm of what is expected, the dignified life has also gone up uh, as part of this position of consumption. So we have scarcity in the midst of abundance. There is never enough. So for capital, there can never be enough. And economics is the science that justifies that, makes it the principle of a whole science. Starts from the very foundation of it, because there can never be enough, and there is never enough. So it's a science that leg legitimizes this uh, condition. This is very different from the classical or the ancient Greek understanding of the economy. I found this quite recently and I was amazed because it was exactly what I wanted to say. I said that Aristotle and the ancient Greeks had said it. And I think it has nothing to do with me being uh, Greek, but, <laughs> but of course they have said most of the things and we have to read them, but I haven't read them uh, adequately. But apparently the, the understanding of economy in the ancient Greek world was very different. So the idea is that we have uh, abundant means and the art of the economy is how do we limit our ends. So nature gives us enough, enough sun, enough water, enough land to live a decent life. The whole art of the economy was a philosophical art. And it was how do we limit ourselves in order to do with this abundance and not destroy it. I would argue that this fundamental starting point of abundance, uh, although it sounds like very paradoxical in the names of uh, ending uh, oil and fossil fuels, climate change, destroy the ecosystems, to start thinking in terms of abundance, I think it's a fundamental shift that we need to do if we were to think about different ecological and social trajectories, and also trajectories that they're not going to be just disasters, trajectories that they can also appeal to the common sense of the people. <laughs> Like, reframe the, the simple and dignified life, but in a context of abundance, not in a context of emergency and scarcity, which has been the basic logic of capitalism since the beginning. Here we find useful in our work in the Degrowth book, and this is how we close the, the book, uh, the work of a French philosopher, Georges Bataille, who argues that the fundamental ecologic pro economic problem has not been a necessity or scarcity, but on the contrary, luxury. He argued that ever since the, there were human societies, there was always an excess of energy on top of what is just necessary to reproduce ourselves and satisfy our basic biological functions. The part of energy that goes to satisfy our basic biological functions is the servile portion of energy, according to Bataille. The rest of the energy is the sovereign share of energy. It's the energy with which we use to give meaning to who we are and what we are as a society or as individuals. It's what we do with the excess, with our luxury that defines societies. So if you take, I think I'm bombarding you with too many ideas, but okay, might be a, a provocation to read the book. Uh, <laughs> but if we take, for example, the Egyptian society, what did they do with their excess energy? They built pyramids and they, they admire the pharaohs. It's not a nice thing what they did, but I'm saying this is what gives them essence, the sovereign use of, of their energy. The Aztecs did crazy, crazy ceremonies and sacrifices. So these are in the book of Bataille. Our society, our capitalist society, what did it do? It took a huge part of this excess of energy that it was producing and brought it back into the system for more accumulation and more growth. That's the fundamental dynamic of growth. It's creating more surplus from energy and humans and bringing it more for more and more growth. It was the first and only civilization that conceived of not destroying ritually this excess energy that it had, but bringing it in to create more and more excess energy. Okay. So the question I would say, both from an ancient Greek classical political economic perspective and from the perspective of Bataille, is not how do we overcome scarcity, which is a standard economic question, but what do we do with our excess? Right now, a lot, a big part of this excess is going to decadent consumption, and I want to be part of your remaining list, because I like a lot uh, the research around the, this area. 
it's going to decadent uh, consumption, and it's going to a lot of wasteful or useless things. I think most of us who are here agree about that. The question is this excess of energy, where can it go? Especially given that this excess of energy is going to diminish. As ecologists and ecological economists, we know that it's going to diminish if we are not to destroy the climate and if we are also to, to live uh, with the internal climate. But still, there will always be the question of what we do with the excess. Do we bring it back into production or do we find outlets that it is dispended in a way that it's socially beneficial? So how do all this crazy ideas relate to the growth. Uh, have like five minutes, it would be okay. Or... Yeah, five minutes. <coughs> First of all, the very simple argument that we've made with John Martinez Ali and, and, and Richard Norgard at the beginning of the crisis, we wrote a paper about the crisis, and I think it's Herman Daly has also made similar arguments, it's the fundamental ecological economic uh, understanding of the crisis. And it's basically that, that the biophysical part of the metabolism sets limits on how fast and how much an economy can grow. And the perpetual growth of 3 or 4% that followed the post-war area was a historical exception. That much Piketty also says now. It was a destruction of the war that then gave rise to this very fast accumulation that takes place in places that they are either destroyed or just under the capitalist circuit, like China, for example. Now, this cannot be sustained for very long. It cannot be sustained for very long also because of resource limitations. Oil is an important limitation. The price skyrocketed at some point uh, before the crisis, uh, if you remember. So resources put, uh, put a limitation. Also, the bigger an economy becomes, the more difficult it becomes to grow more. No? It's one thing if you have a very small economy to double, and another one thing if you have an economy that's one million times bigger to double to two million. No? Every doubling becomes more and more difficult. So we argued that already from the 70s, this limit to growth start becoming apparent. And the solution that was uh, found in the system was the production of credit, borrowing from the future. This borrowing from the future collapsed in 2008, and the rising power, uh, prices of oil were a fundamental catalyst to showing like this unsustainability of this fictitious growth to be sustained in the long term. Okay? That's an understanding of the crisis that brings in some of the elements that I presented uh, before. The second the argument that I take from what I presented before, and it's very apparent in the degrowth debates, is that there are, there are, there have always been, and they, that they are growing and flourishing in the context of the crisis, alternative economies. Economies that we try to satisfy our needs without recourse to wage labor, uh, monetary exchange, and uh, private property. Alternative economies. Economies of household, economies of uh, cooperative economies, urban gardens, time banks. We heard about all these things yesterday. No? These alternative economies have always been there, and they strengthen in times of crisis when the state and the market cannot satisfy the basic needs of people. And that these alternative economies are embodying and representing the different understanding of the economy that I just presented before. So they have a very different understanding both of their ecology, of their political project, etc. Okay, that's a huge discussion, but I'm just trying to idea here. <laughs> Finally, I would say that there are also concrete institutional changes in policy reforms, very radical reforms, but nonetheless uh, reforms. Uh, that they are out there on the table and that they fit uh, with uh, the growth idea, with the idea of a planned uh, contraction of the economy. So carbon taxes, I was very happy to be yesterday on a very creative <coughs> panel about basing income, uh, caps on resources, reduced working hours, etc. The question is how do we formulate these proposals though? Because very often they are formulated within a Keynesian framework, you not know, giving money to the people so that the economy starts growing again. Which I think is problematic. In a, in a degrowth discourse, we formulate them as by putting limits to carbon emissions, for example, and taxing carbon. And from there, raising money, we can pay basic income to make sure, for example, that people can sustain themselves without having to grow the economy in the material through. So there is always an attention to not fueling the same growth accumulation uh, dynamic that we think is part of the problem. If you want to think of it from the perspective that I said before of luxury or of uh, abundance and uh, expanding the excess, 
We might think of proposals as a basic income or as a reduced working hours or leaving oil in the soil, not taking oil out, as ways of expanding this success, of not taking this success and putting it back into the production economy, leaving resources idle, not making work to sustain this uh, ever ever growing system, not taking resources out. This, I mean, these proposals you cannot make them in this way by any means within the standard economic framework. If you're saying, I did a master's in economics and macroeconomics quite recently, and I did my master's thesis on reducing working hours. So when I presented it to my professors, I just had blank faces. <laughs> this was quite uh, bold of you, this. Uh, yes, it's something that they cannot discuss within the terms. Reducing work, working hours is going to increase the cost of labor, it's going to dampen the economy, it's going to create more unemployment, it's all downhill. You know? We need a new new framework in order to put these questions. So the final final point, and I'm done. <laughs> and this is not because I will have it in my presentation, but because Philip asked for it. So he said, he said, okay, most people will be in tune with the big growth method, but how do we do it? And of course, that's a, that's an impossible question to answer. No, just to give my personal personal reflection, personal state of being in this question. No? So I think there is an optimistic and there is a pessimistic or probably realistic answer to this question. The optimistic would be just to say like in the past we know how transformational or exit change takes place. We know how capitalism emerged out of feudalism, for example. No? But there are many different grassroots practices or new economic transactions taking place. Uh, common senses of people participating in these practices uh, changed. New conditions, environmental and social conditions were created, the colonies, etc. And then there were, of course, political battles by the bourgeois against the royal regimes to change also the institutions in a way that favored their economic practices and their visions. No? This was a quite revolutionary, in a sense, change that involved all the strategies, or most of the strategies that John talked about after early Poland, right? No? <coughs> Interstitial changes changing the, the foundations of the economy, and at the same time reforms and revolutions, and revolutions to change the institutional and the political context. We know that this happened, and we might do a wishful thinking that this can happen again. No? And I think it's important to do this wishful thinking and behave as if it could happen again. <coughs> Romy Klein is doing this very well, I think. I would be my key man. You know, there are people who are very constantly optimistic, and I like their optimism, and I think it's important to make this a self-fulfilled prophecy, because if we are saying it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen, you know? At the same time, I think we can have uh, optimism of the will, but pessimism of thought, no? So if I do the diagnosis, I don't think this is going to happen, and it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. I mean, we don't see any political openings literally anywhere, no? The best we've seen in Europe can be Spain, you know, I live in Spain, it's very good. There are political forces there that they are putting new ideas on the table, but it's far from this type of ideas. No? They are more into the redistributive Keynesian. US the same, England, I mean, you, can, you can be optimistic, but I think it would take many years, as we've heard uh, constantly, and I don't see this happening in the time frame that we, it's really urgent in terms of climate change. So we can start becoming pessimistic or realistic. And start thinking about scenarios of the future. So the pessimistic or realistic scenario is that climate will change, climate will change disastrously, and this will create a new context and a new conditions of social possibility. It's not a nice message, but I think it's also a message that if we read history, it's a message that's coming from history. The only way the capitalist system redistributed was through a huge catastrophe that was the Second World War, unfortunately. It didn't plan it and do it smoothly, do it through a catastrophe, and you do it at the gunpoint with the competition with the Soviet system that almost brought the end of the world as we knew it. So this is this is the conditions that led to a type of the 30 glorious years of social welfare state. So I'm afraid that the pessimist, uh, not necessarily pessimist, but the realistic uh, understanding would be that. But even if this were to be the case, I think it still rests on us for creating the alternatives and having the alternatives ready for us conditions change for these alternatives to emerge rather than other much forced alternatives that we can imagine emerging within a context of disaster. So on this very hopeful message. <laughs> Thank you.
here if I stand here. This is a bit awkward, but thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, and we have about 15 minutes for questions, so I invite you to raise your hands and I'll take them um, two at a time. No, I can take more than two because they took more time. So let's take well, three or four. I can make Okay, I see John here and I hand it back. One minute, I'm going to start running. <laughs> <laughs> hi, um, hi, Gary Bus. Thank you very much. Jean Boucher from George Mason. Um, this, I've heard you speak before and I've been following Debra for a while. Two weeks ago, I was in DC at Brookings and um, Nicholas Stern was there with a couple of folks. And, um, so one of those guys just said, well, now we know that there's not a conflict between climate development and growth. And they all nodded their head. And, and for me, I was sitting at, well, they all drank the same Kool-Aid, I guess. Um, so when we have people at that sort of level of both theorizing and um, representing, I guess, the status quo of the present, economic system, as you've explained it. Um, and even when you present it to your professors to reduce the daily work day, and everyone stares at you like you have two heads. I mean, is this, is this a, I mean, I, these, these are very bright people, right? And I, I can't understand how they can, uh, maybe a couple papers were written or theorized that somehow we can have growth and development and save the climate all at the same time. I, I'm just wondering, is, uh, I don't know, how do they be, how are they so smart? And then they still have this idea. Is it? Sorry. So we'll take one, uh, one question before we let Joe go. Do you want to? Okay, we'll go for four more. Um, and I would encourage you to keep your questions short. So I have um, someone at the back and then Lucia and someone at the front here. Hi, I'm Jeff Gamela from Aalto University. One guess, question, you had this very nice picture about the iceberg. And then afterwards you try to prove that there's this iceberg in the terms of this little tip of the iceberg with economics. So why is it so important to describe the rest of the iceberg with the terms of economy, economics? Why don't you just study the other part of the iceberg, which seems to be much more relevant and important? Why, why should we be able to communicate with the terms or refer it to the terms of economics? Yes, Lucia Hajj from Copenhagen Business School. Um, I have so many questions, but I'm going to pick one, a quick one. Um, what about, there's people like environmental um, evolutionary psychologists who are working on like biases, for instance, and there, there's people who claim that there's this, this uh, status, it's one of or the, the quest for status, one of those hardwired biases that you just find everywhere, and like in all types of societies, as a handful of other ones. So um, how does that get, uh, this, this picture of humans, uh, how does that get along with uh, your ideas of, well, non-positional consumption? Hi. Um, I really liked your idea about focusing on what we do with can I just for you one second? Is there, can anyone at the back hear me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Paul. I, I really like your point that we need to focus on what we do with the surplus, but maybe not so much on scarcity. But um, let me sort of push back like a neoclassical economist might, even though that's not true. Right? So they would admit that they care about what happens to the surplus and that equity matters and, up and so forth, but then they get kind of sloppy and let everybody just focus on economic output. But suppose we weren't so sloppy. Why couldn't we? allow growth, but number one, change our welfare measure to include other attributes of what's happening, and then adjust incentive to try to pursue this more 
robust welfare regime. So the first one, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't paint it so so black and white. So I don't think I'm much cleverer than Nicola Stern and that I have it right and he has it wrong. So I think these are complex scientific questions and uh, these are debates, they are very strong. So I take a position and mainstream people take take another position about the possibilities of, uh, of growth and environmental sustainability. And they are quite strong and good arguments on the other side too. So uh, I don't want to be one of those put these bets and they say who's going to be right and who's going to be wrong. I think as we heard yesterday, these are very complex questions and we have uh, limited uh, answers. But I think our answers reflect also our politics. So economists since the beginning of the, of the discipline until today has been the discipline that has legitimated the current system and wants to make the current system survive uh, at all costs. They cannot accept the possibility that the current system might have fundamental structural problems and might not survive. So they have both to find solutions for that and create models that explain you why the system is the only possible uh, outcome. You are trained like that when you go to economics, you know, from the beginning. I mean, I saw it in my class because I was older and I could observe what was happening. But like students who wanted to ask questions outside of the box were disciplined, you know. They were disciplined in a hard way. They were disciplined by being told by professors who know much more than they are asking a stupid question, but they were also disciplined by the type of exams. So there's a whole community that's being reproduced to do to, to become, I think that's a nice metaphor, might be a little bit exaggerated by the cells that Tusk has made in the media. They are the priests of the current system. So it's very difficult to convince the priests to become atheists in a way. You know? uh, I wouldn't expect it, but at the same time, I think it's an important debate to be had. Unfortunately, it's a debate that it's not being had. So people like us, ecological economists, who are critical, we are considered like uh, some kind of video. Uh, strange cases, you know, it's, like, it's, it's really difficult to, to have this debate. Unfortunately, in the 70s, this debate was much more alive and had an equal terms with economics. Today, I don't see, I don't see this open. And this is what worries me the most. But I think it's also kind of human reaction, you know, when you see the thing coming, and you just say, okay, I can just hope that it's not true, you know, that there is a solution. I prefer to think that than thinking that I have to change fundamentally the system. The second, why study the uh, other side of the iceberg? Uh, no, I think I think the type of discourse I promoted here, you know, it was very qualitative, it was very verbal, it wasn't about money. It was a discourse that tries to capture the, the whole iceberg, including the tip and including uh, the surface. And I think we need language like the one we are developing in the growth that comes from different disciplines and it's not economistic. Uh, Within the discourse community, the, the growth community, there is always the criticism, why do we keep talking about economics and in economic terms? I think we cannot afford the luxury of not talking about economics because it is the dominant discourse. It's the one that saves policy. It's the one that saves also public debates. So we have to produce alternatives without falling in the trap of using the, the same tools of, uh, of, the, of the discourse of economics. So I'm um, balancing in this fine line, you know, but I, I realize the danger of what you're saying, that you might end up using the same discourse and then you're not know, doing something very really different. About evolutionary psychology, I studied a little bit of evolution, so I'm happy to, to, to have strong opinions on these matters of evolution. I was reading the book of a friend recently, a manuscript that I got very annoyed with him, but he's a very good friend, you know, because he had all this evolutionary justification of the way things are, you know, women do this because women are hard work to do that, men do this, you know, like uh, high salaried people are high salaried because they are risk takers, and I said, you know, who, who proved, uh, who, who has really proven uh, all these things and has said that they're like that, but of course the argument that you're making is a, it's a much more, I would say, precise and uh, right one, I just wanted to say this about my my question of evolutionary arguments. But the argument you're making is right, yes. There might be evidence that uh, we are hardwired, for example, to be status seekers. We are, of course, hardwired to do hundreds of different things, to be also empathy, to be love givers, to be gift givers. Uh, so yes, we are, we are hardwired to do hundreds of different things that at some point provided some abundance in our communities uh, back in the past, and we can never prove it, so this is just speculation. But we, yes, we are hardwired to be status, uh, status seekers, but what does status mean? This is a social, social concept, for example. What forms does the status take? And what does it mean, even if we are uh, status seekers? This doesn't mean that the society cannot devise mechanisms to reprimand 
uh, start to sit in that it realizes that it's catastrophic for it. So there is fantastic work by anthropologists of hunter gatherers that give you all these examples of egalitarian societies. You know, that the guy who brings back the big uh, animal instead of you're stupid, you know, you're the worst, give it to the community, you know, and you go away, you know. This is a very particular way of a society finding a way to, to, to quench this uh, status seeking uh, uh, quest that might take a particular form of inegalitarian relationship, <coughs> etc. So, Skidelsky and Skidelsky in a book that's recent, it's a nice read called How Much Is Enough. Uh, he's a, he's a Keynesian <coughs> economist, he's a biographer of Keynes, and his son is an anthropologist. <coughs> and they're saying that capitalist is the first system that this biological reality of status seeking. It took it and it made it, um, it made it the very basic logic of the system, the fuel of the system. So I don't think there is anything natural or revolutionary in the way the current system really uh, starts to shift. I know, I know, change the way we, we measure growth and allow it. This is a huge discussion, and that's a typical debate I get when I uh, present the growth. So my first thing would be like, even if we change that we have a better indicator of something called welfare, why would we need it to grow one part perpetuity? You know, if we need it to flourish, it means that at some point it should reach a satiation point. Maybe the satiation point has been reached already. Now, if this welfare had also a material dimension that I argued it probably would have, uh, I think it simply cannot. If, if I am correct, and of course then there are strands in environmental economists that think it is possible for this welfare to increase by re and reducing its material throughput. I believe that it's not, but then it's a debate. So my, my, my argument is coming from the point of view that of course I have to defend that I don't think that this welfare can, doesn't have to increase, and if an input was to increase, I don't think it can increase without more and more material throughput. So um, I'm going to ask for two more questions, and then we'll wrap up. Two here at the front, but one of them might be willing to speak their question if there's someone else. Okay, uh, Philip and then Helena, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. Um, I'd like to highlight the, this idea that you present of framing our our lives in terms of and, and the field of economics in terms of scarcity versus abundance. I think it's such an essential point that you make. I was recently at a talk about food production system, and I realized as I was listening to it that, that the whole system of industrial production of food is justified by the concept of scarcity. And in fact, there is no scarcity of food production in the world. Uh, it's, there are other issues that cause famines and, and so on. But it's this idea of scarcity that justifies everything that we do to, to run this dead end, in the end, system of industrial production of food. So I think it's a very important point for us to actually have this different framing of our reality. <coughs> <coughs> so, thank you. And um, I was pondering about power and power relationships and, and so on. So you call it political economy of, uh, of the growth, right? Of, <coughs> of the political economy. So political economy is about power. And of course, we all know that, that there are huge power structures that keep the present place of the situation in place, including economics as a science. So, and of course, uh, the financial system. and all the power relationships, and you were very implicit about talking about that. Maybe so maybe you can bring the political a little bit more explicit. Yeah, one more. We've got two minutes. Okay. I see it's here. First, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I noticed in your chart correlating um, economic growth with um, the uh, level of CO2 emissions, that um, you only went through the year 2010. And there are some arguments that are currently being made that technological improvements, whether we're talking about wind energy, solar energy, 
have been so dramatic in the last few years that very soon we may actually see a crossing of those two, those two lines. And let's suppose such a crossing occurs. I realize that there are constraints other than CO2, but that's been the big thing in everyone's minds over the last several years. If those two lines cross, and in fact, CO2 emissions continue to actually drop while growth continues, would you be altering the argument that you've been making here today? Yes, so in 2014, there was, there was a plateau of emissions. I mean, what are the origins of this? Is, is maybe it needs to be studied. For example, there was a study that shows that the plateau of carbon emissions in the US from 2007 to 14 was mostly due to the effect of recession at the beginning. So there is, there is a work to be done there. But let's assume that there is something happening then and there is a plateau. And let's think also that this plateau has to become falling, not just a, a plateau. But Let's assume that it was going to happen. I still believe that it would be much easier to happen without growth than without with growth. So if we need like an improvement of efficiency of eight, six to seven percent of carbon efficiency per year, not six or seven percent to reach the Paris goals. If we have three percent growth, this means we need ten percent improvement of efficiency. If we have zero percent growth or minus two, then it means we just need three or two. So in any case, I think the argument goes that with an ever increasing uh, Economy, uh, it makes it much harder to say the least, if not impossible. But I would say it much harder. Then it's also that it's not just climate change that we're talking about. I mean, the economic growth comes with material fuel, it comes with ecosystem and uh, destruction, there's a million ecosystem assessment. So there are all these other factors that they're going to get also aggravated <laughs> by a shift to renewable energies. It's not, it's not going to be just renewable energies are not angelic in other aspects in terms of the transformation of ecosystems. Uh, so there are also these other factors that they stand to benefit by, by less growth. So I would, I would still keep the argument. Uh, Halina made a good point, which was fully what I want to, uh, the point I wanted to make. And uh, Philip? Yes, I, I didn't go into the, the details, but not because, uh, not because I don't think they're important, because I, but because I didn't have the time and I think they are quite obvious. So there are the best and far interest that keep the system in a, in a particular configuration. Uh, it's not my expertise to analyze them, but um, I think also the, the few discussions that I've heard up to now here, they are coming up uh, constantly. There is the power of the media, there is the best power of the financial sector, so there is the power of the in, uh, of economics, and these are articulated in the way the system is stuck in its current uh, configuration and trajectory. So please join me in thanking for the announcements um, before you adjourn. Um, so once again, thank you to the local and campus community members who joined us. Um, you're very welcome to be here. And I want to just um, uh, say you're welcome to come back for, we have another keynote, uh, Dr. William Reese today at 1.30, tomorrow Lucia Reich at 9 a.m. And if you miss them and you would like to catch them, they are being live streamed on SCORE's YouTube channel. Um, conference participants, we now have a 30-minute break. Um, again, you'll have refreshments out here, bathrooms this side. Um, just another reminder, Annabelle, are you in the room? Annabelle's not in the room, but she, oh, she is. Hi, Annabelle. Annabelle is uh, one of the editors um, of the Rutledge series on, oh, I've forgotten the name now, it's right now. What is it called? Rutledge Score Book Series. Oh, is it? Oh, actually, okay. Uh, so you're welcome to meet with Annabelle in the break, um, look at the books, and also talk about future publication plans. <laughs> I also want to remind people of the video in Wells 3, the room here. Um, if you'd like to leave a little snippet about the importance of sustainable consumption work, uh, please feel free. If you'd like to um, share an, a valuable teaching strategy that you've tried that you um, might uh, be willing to share with the group, please consider doing that as well. There are volunteers next door to help capture your ideas and comments. Um, finally, if you have not signed up, um, there is the Artist Showcase this afternoon that's limited in the number of participants because of uh, the size of the room. So if you haven't signed up yet, I think there were a few more spaces. 
the sign-up sheet is just out by the coat room. And finally, um, a, a one change that I want to mention, if you look at your program now, we're getting ready to go into one breakout session before lunch. Um, you'll see in this coffee break, we, we initially set a group photo. Um, since we're just such a healthy group, we've been trying to think about how in the world we would be able to get everyone's faces. So we've decided not to do it now. And instead, if you look after session, parallel session three, um, or I'm sorry, just after parallel session four, so parallel session four goes from 3.15 to 4.45. There's a 15 minute transition before the business meeting, at which everyone is welcome to, by the way. So this board business meeting is where we discuss the future of our society and we hope many of you will participate in that conversation. Just before that, we're gonna invite you to meet us um, on the library steps. So you all have seen uh, the big quad that you've walked across to get to Corbett, right? the big grassy area, there's a beautiful library at the head of that with a nice set of steps where I think we can line up and get a really nice photo. I've gotten somebody to get a step ladder, so we'll take the story banner and hopefully be able to get everyone in the picture. So meet me there, and then just after that, we'll be going to the Square Business Meeting. Um, it will either be in DC Corbett 107, we've got wine, appetizers, so it should be a nice time, uh, and hopefully you can join us. And maybe if it's really nice and the acoustics are good, maybe we'll just have a little picnic on the quad for a business meeting. We'll see. We'll, we'll discuss it when we get there. So those are the changes. Um, I don't think there's anything else to say. Have a nice break, and we'll see you in the next parallel session back here for lunch.